Okay, so welcome to today's um, AS English Live lesson. And I'm fine, thank you. I hope you're fine as well. <laughs> Let's go to our lesson for today, which is example candidate responses. Okay, um, but before we get started on that, I'm just going to bring the chat box to the side so I can see if you're making comments as I'm going through the work. Remember, feel free to ask me questions or to, um, to give your opinion on something as we go through the extract if you want to. You're more than welcome to do that. Sometimes I might just assume you have knowledge of something and I move on. You're welcome to stop me and ask questions if you need to. Okay. All right, so we've been looking at these example candidate responses. Last, uh, the last two lessons we've been looking at passages one, the paper one passages, where you have to give a commentary and in question A, and then in question B, you have to um, create some sort of directed writing. In other words, according to some sort of direction that they give you. Okay, but now today I'd like to look at paper two. All right, so um, this is going to all be about imaginative writing. So that's what we're going to look at today, imaginative writing. And I think in this particular paper, I do get the impression, and you might see that as well as we go through it, that perhaps grammar and punctuation rules and sentence structures and things do not seem to be as important as you might expect Cambridge to want them to be, okay? Um, so what you'll see is today in this, quite a, it's quite an interesting um, answer that the student has written to the question. There's a lot of errors in it, a lot of things that I would be marking, if I were marking for you, that, I, that obviously that I'm not going to mark here today. So I struggle when I read this extract, I struggle to know when um, a sentence stops and when it starts because there's no punctuation. But let's try to overlook that. I think here, when it comes to imaginative writing, I get the impression from what I'm seeing in these candidate responses that Cambridge would want you to be as imaginative as possible. So, in other words, entertain your marker. All right? Try to entertain as much as you can. Try to be as creative as you can, within reason. Okay, Don't become too wacky or off the wall, but try to be imaginative and creative. And hello to those of you who are just joining now. Nice to see you. <laughs> okay, so bear with me as I try to read through this candidate's um, sample response. The candidate doesn't have bad handwriting, but from time to time, I cannot always decipher their words. And like I say, their sentences are not clear. So I'll try to read it as best I can. The first thing we do before looking at these things is to read through the question. What does the question want of you? And remember, the first three questions of paper two will be related to imaginative writing. So here is question, one, uh, question number one, or option one of question one. Write the opening to a story. So it's got to be the opening. And usually, with most openings to a story, the focus is on setting and or characterization. Okay, so these are the two things that you generally focus on when you open up a story. You want to show where things are happening, possibly when they're happening, and who it's happening to. Now, this story has to be called Robot World. And so, just from the title alone, you should have a good idea that you are dealing with the sci-fi genre, science fiction, okay? also known as speculative fiction, because you can speculate as to what has happened and whether it could ever possibly happen. So opening to a story called Robot World, in your writing, create a detailed sense of a futuristic and mysterious environment. Okay, so you'll notice if you do, if you have watched any science fiction type of films, they tend to try to create a mysterious environment because the future is unknown. Um, because we generally see the future as something quite what we call dystopian. That is the opposite of utopian. Okay, so it's the opposite of utopian. And um, I'm sure most of you have heard of the word utopia, which is another Kind of um, a synonym for paradise, but this is the opposite to that. It's, it's, it's a bit not hellish, but something not quite conducive to human life or to happiness. Okay, 
Anyway, let's have a look at this candidate's response, keeping all of these things in mind. It has to be an opening to a story called Robot World. It must be sci-fi. It must be a futuristic setting, and it must be mysterious. Now remember that sci-fi is different to fantasy because sci-fi focuses on technology, whereas fantasy focuses more on magical or um, strange, unreal creatures. Okay. Right, so let's get into this. Here is the candidate's response. The tracks were far easier to cover the surface at this point, uneven and slippy. I adopted them by pressing the menu button on my left arm. I could then scroll through hundreds of options. This was a built-in feature of the new software given to me as the X9 model. So the first few opening sentences are already very um, apparent, very obviously sci-fi in nature, okay? Um, not so much the opening sentence, but the, the next one. I adopted them by pressing the menu button on my left arm. I then scrolled through hundreds of options. This was a built-in feature of the new software given to me as the X9 model. An X9 model who can think, who um, has, you know, obvious, uh, well, some kind of train of thought, and therefore must be a robot. Okay. So this person who is writing this is familiar with science, with the science fiction genre, which is probably why they've chosen to answer this particular question, but which is why I always say, try and read as widely as you can. Get to know as many styles or genres of literature um, as you can, okay. My eyes are cameras that send information to the server. This is the largest of the family and sits amongst the purple and green water in the center of this city. Isn't this mysterious? Purple and green water. A service sits in the purple and green water. It's mysterious. It's unusual. This is not our current world. The yellow gases that are ever present, like humans, refer to clouds or mist, sometimes above us, above us, but often around us. This is the source of energy we use. So no matter how far we go, we have full power and never run out or die. I have selected my tracks as this allows me to grip our surface on our planet. Smooth and seamless motion as the moving parts all transform, allowing simple access to my feet. Okay. Sometimes I find it a bit confusing because um, is it tracks? Is, it, uh, is he rolling on tracks? Is he using feet? It's, it's not quite clear. Okay. Oh, and sorry, here's an example of where a sentence just continues, and so you have to try and keep a lot of train of thought going. Okay, so I'm going to um, start here. My tracks, as this allows me to grip our surface of our planet, smooth and seamless mo motion as the moving parts all transform, allowing simple access to my feet. Like soldiers in a line, all of the X9s move together, a rolling thunder at the same time. A block of six is how we patrol the streets beaming information back to the mothership. Nothing is left untouched as we sweep systematically top to bottom, left and right. Our software program update is just right. So lots of uh, terminology here, typical sci-fi ideas like the mothership, um, software programs. Technology is definitely the focus in this section. We are searching for the code breaker a programmer or even a killer, the human who started this all, the one who, who knew it all. Spelling error there. Uh, let's move down. It was fine to start with robot help. The software that broke made us fight. The X3 robot is a joke. Okay, so here <clears throat> there is a bit of a plot line, a bit of a storyline that is created. That initially, what humans were probably trying to do is to just start, start like, or, you know, introduce some robot help into everyday life, which ironically is happening with us. Okay, start with robot help, but then the code breaker must have broken the software code, and that is what made the robots fight. But that original helpful robot, the X3, that's a joke. Remember, now we're on the X9, so progress has been made. Okay. The future has changed and we will win. The straight lines and technology that help us, help us out. I'm not sure what that says, it help us something. 
um, survey, no, no, surely this will all be all right. Surely this will all be all right. Law and order is how we came about. Corrective measures by robots. They could outrun, outdrive, outfly all other life forms. Then we fought an electronic battle, wires and lights fading as we fought. My weapon system is the highest quality. Machine guns, lasers, bombs and guns, all at the touch of the button on my arm. I scroll through the options. Okay, so here it's unclear to me whether the X9 was fighting the older robots, the X3, the ones that were, uh, were meant to help humans, or if they're all fighting the humans together. To me, that's slightly unclear, but you can read it for yourself and, and maybe it'll be clearer to you. Um, now I roll across this land, trying to find normality and a friend. It was such a lovely place, green fields and charging points and humans too. We were a minority, but useful too. Now with the war we had, survival is what I do. Isn't it strange? So I, I get a bit confused here because it's almost as if the robot talks affectionately about humans. The, um, the robot, this robot likes the fact that it's a lovely place, that they are green fields. Is that something a robot would like? Who knows? Charging points. I know why they'd like that. And humans too. Is that it's, it's almost given in a positive way. So is your war against the humans or not? Anyway, this is a great A answer, huh? This is a great A answer. We were a minority, but useful too. So the robots are a minority. Now with the war we had, survival is what I do. Amidst the purple and green water, yellow gases too. Now this is good because what's happening is the writer is referring back to imagery that they conjured up before, creating a sense of continuity. That is clever. And if you can do something like that in your writing where you repeat something or emphasize something you've mentioned before, it just strengthens your, your ideas a bit more. It makes it more real. Okay. So amidst the purple and green water, yellow gases too. A land that has no start or finish to the day. I scan the horizon. Good use of terminology there. It's, it is dark and gray, looking at buildings that burn all day over the, there, robots burn in a pile, a junkyard of electrical hay, wires and rods and lights all stacked up into the sky. Now look at this very nice metaphor. Okay, there's a comparison being made to all these um, robot leftovers that they, and burning buildings. It looks like a junkyard of electrical Hey, now that is a very clever image um, to conjure up. This this uh, hay is just like little wires sticking every, out everywhere. And so um, it's a very, very clever comparison, this electrical hay. And then a list of three is used to explain why it might look like this hay. Wires and rods and lights all stacked up into the sky. The noises that are transmitted are loud and high pitched. Now this is interesting because in imaginative writing, you can choose to do narrative or descriptive <clears throat> writing. But here, um, as part of the narrative, as part of the opening to the story, a lot of description is being used and that in turn strengthens the work. It makes it so much better, okay? Because this writer is pulling on the senses. Now we've had the visual, what can be seen by the robot, and now we're looking at what can be heard pulling on the senses and that's important the noises that are transmitted are loud and high-pitched like a cry whoosh and zip as robots pass me by from time to time it's interesting that this you'll notice okay and this is what the first example this writer makes things rhyme this is not the first time it happens it happens another i think another two times and it's clever. I don't know if it's done on purpose or if it's just by accident, but the fact that it happens again shows that it might have been planned, which is incredible. Um, so using a simile, the noise is a, a high and a loud and high pitched like a cry, but then also using onomatopoeia. How often do you use onomatopoeia like whoosh, zip, bang, bad? 
how often do you use that in your writing, in a story? Use your knowledge of language when you write imaginatively, okay? So whoosh and zip as robots pass you by. A ringing like a phone. I have to watch out as that is a drone. The server sends them out on a hunt to find electrical impulses or stores of parts, anything to help them win the fight. So that's interesting. The server that this robot is related to and refers to as part of his family also has drones looking for, for parts. And the robot has to be wary of those drones, which is ironic because they're all part of the same family, but maybe that's how machines operate. You know, maybe there's um, a sort of a hierarchy or something where you have to acknowledge that you are endangered by another one of your own and you know your place, they know their place and you each have your mission to do. Um, was the writer wise enough to do that or are they getting confused? I can't tell. <laughs> okay, so you can let me know what you think um, if you want. So I have to watch out as that is a drone. The service sends them out on a hunt, find electrical impulses or stores of parts, anything to help them win the fight. The only humans I have seen all wear masks, no real life for them. It's a robot or machine that lives now. Hmm, what does that mean? Does that mean that there are humans and they're robots and that's it? Or have the humans somehow become robotic? Unclear. Okay. Let's have a look. Um, so, uh, the only humans I have seen all wear masks, no real life for them. It's a robot or machine that lives now. Remove the gases. Then we might see normal life return for me. Wow, remove the gases, which keeps the robot alive. Then we might see normal life return for me. It's a bit confusing. Maybe this robot was a human. It's unclear. Red lights flashing in the distance. Flashes of ultra bright white across the sky. Other robots go. I have no smell, but I can tell as I scan the ground and building in front, I connect the internet to see what it was that burns and dies in front of me. So there's always this juxtaposition between something that is human, someone human, and someone that is, or something that is robotic. This idea of smelling, because perhaps a human would have smelt that something is burning and dying in front of them. The robot cannot do that. The robot simply observes it. Okay. So once again, we are in a dystopian setting where things are not particularly conducive to happiness or life or human life form, should I say. The whole planet is under arrest. Robots that once were very few have taken over the world for all to see. They say we have no feelings. This is untrue. Futuristic land for this is too far even i as a robot think it is it's gone too far images are projected onto the floor this made the humans think they were in a beautiful land green slabs for fields black tar roads blue for sky a false sense of belief that we gave now, when you see through my camera feed, everything is uneven with no dimension. When the power is switched off, nothing can be seen. Black and white dots, like a million on a screen. Objects stand like buildings or trees, but it's imagery we send for all to see. The server decides what is new, a color or scene that is sent. As programmed, all we do is move around amongst this futuristic land. You decide what we see as you're the operator of me. Now the robot must be referring to the server. Um, a robot land you wanted to create. Destruction was part of this plight to create your perfect delight. You see the rhyming there? I'm sorry, I don't know why my pen is going a bit crazy. I'm just gonna try and remove that. So, um, destruction, and the spelling errors are out. Destruction was part of this plight to create your perfect delight. <laughs> The, um, the, hang on, the input by you can always change and your mood gives the world a different shape or one 
or, hmm, or tone or color, sorry, a different shape or tone or color, when it gives no pleasure, you just switch off the power. The thing is, when you do, you think that's all down to you. Stop thinking you are real. You are a robot, just like me, and our world changes every day. We never switch off and never die. Our planet and world is whatever we want, futuristic or not, or just very bland. We are robots, and we have taken over this land. So this could be very cleverly done. I don't know if you experienced the... To me, it was quite disjointed trying to make sense of everything, perhaps of how a robot would think. So you could say that this writer was being very intelligent in creating this very uh, sort of disjointed thoughts, incomplete sentences, but jumping from one thought to the next, sometimes having very strong feelings, sometimes um, embracing this idea of family with the server, and then other times being annoyed with the server here at the end, kind of almost frustrated thinking that this, you know, how dare the server think it better than me, a robot, <laughs> is the kind of impression I'm getting. And then um, it's almost as if this robot is trying to come to terms with the idea that it does have feelings. That could be what's explored in the rest of the story, how the robots um, constantly upgrade, update, and have to learn how to feel, which is what makes humans human, and how perhaps this is a struggle for robots or um, sort of a technology to do. So this could be intelligent, it could be a fluke. <laughs> I'm not sure. Remember, the writer is under time pressure, but this writer certainly knows the sci-fi genre well, and I think has kind of conveyed uh, the thoughts of a machine well. You can give me your opinions if you want. Let's have a look at what the examiner has said. Uh, and in fact, um, maybe, uh, yeah, no, okay, I'm, I'm going to ask your, your um, opinions after we've gone through this. Okay, so they got a grade A. It was a 20 out of 25, so it's not the highest of A's that you can get, but it's quite high, a 20 out of 25. And maybe they would have scored more if they had paid attention to spelling and punctuation and sentence structure. it could be argued. But what does the examiner like? The candidate's opening to a story entitled robot world shows a pleasing sense of voice and fluency which is ironic because i find it quite disjointed but it does run on from one idea to another you could say the answer draws effectively on the conventions of the science fiction genre to establish a narrative a storyline that is presented with confidence and precision it is quite confident writing the candidate combines the demands for a detailed description of a setting that is futuristic and mysterious. So in other words, the candidate is answering the question. Remember, the question said it wanted a detailed description. The writer definitely goes into detail. Okay, there is a lot of detail. Uh, the setting that is futuristic and mysterious. We struggle to understand what is, what is quite going on. It's an unusual setting. Okay, so they have done that quite well. Um, so it combines the demands for a detailed description of a setting that is futuristic and mysterious and the need to establish the beginnings of a story. And that's perhaps why you could argue it's so muddled. Um, because sometimes if you're just given the impressions of um, a, a, a protagonist or a character from the start and at this point they're um, some sort of robot, perhaps there would be muddled thoughts. And that is a nice way to, to um, open up a story with this confusion. It offers the unusual perspective of a robot, which seems very lifelike and human in feeling and thought. Yeah, so I, I almost thought that perhaps this robot had been human previously. Maybe this is more of a cyborg than it is a robot, but the robot affirms that it's robot, robotic <laughs> constantly, that it is a robot. So um, yeah, I think that we can't really say that. But yes, human in feeling and thought, yet retaining the robotic features of having menu buttons on arms, cameras in place of eyes, and needing to roll across land. Okay. The candidate establishes the robot's mission to find the code breaker. And this is ultimately this, the main storyline, to find the code breaker, thereby satisfying the requirement for the opening to a story. A range of imaginative and scientific vocabulary and sentence variation is in evidence, showing a tight sense of control. 
<laughs> so this is ironic because um, a range of imaginative definitely and scientific vocabulary definitely sentence variation. Well, one could call them sentence errors, but I suppose because we are, uh, this is imaginative, we could look at it in a good light, okay? So yes, um, vocabulary and sentence variation in, is an evidence showing a tight sense of control. I would debate that, but who am I? The semantic field, and when we talk about a semantic field, it's about words or ideas that are related in meaning. Okay? So, for example, science fiction as a genre will have a semantic field. Robots, spaceships, technology, cyborgs, those are all a semantic field, a field of meaning that is created. The semantic field is appropriately science fiction, absolutely. X9s, beaming information, lasers, charging points. This writer knows technology. There are some uses of comparison, in other words, metaphors and similes. So there are some uses of comparison. A junkyard of electrical hay, which is brilliant. All of the X9s move together, a rolling thunder, very good. Um, so those were nice comparisons. An engaging range of linguistic devices like alliteration, which sorry, I didn't look at, but if you read through it, you'll find it. The juxtaposition of the abstract, of things that you can't quite grab, ideas and thoughts, for example, love, power, hate, these are all abstract. So there's a juxtaposition of the abstract, even the robot thinking of feelings, that's something abstract. And then the concrete, what I must do, you know, the, what the robot has to do, the practicalities. So the writer has juxtaposed, opposed those two things well. And the use of parallel structures create a strong sense of voice and purpose. And for example, one use of parallel structures, there's actually two that we might've looked at, was that repetition of the yellow and purple water and the yellow gases, okay? Or the green and purple water and the yellow gases, sorry. That is repeated, there's a parallel structure that's created. This, the server, me. This, me, the server. There's something sort of parallel going on there. And then um, that rhyming that they do, <laughs> that the, the kind of poetical rhyme that they do happens once and, then, and later on it happens again. Is the robot trying to learn rhyme? Is the robot using rhyme in a human kind of a way? It, you know, these are things we can question. So it creates a strong sense of voice and purpose. I do think this robot has a strong sense of voice, even if it's a somewhat confused voice, but okay. Overall, this is an, imag is an imaginative and sustained response, blending conventions description and narrative into a cohesive whole. So in other words, the conventions of sci-fi, the way that details are described as per the question, and there is a storyline that this works around. This is the kind of thing you might find at to, in the opening of a novel, of a story. While there are a few lapses, they do not detract from the quality of the answer in its entirety. And perhaps, like I say, these lapses is possibly what gave a 20 out of 25. And here's this, um, a comment here. The story is well thought out, yes, but the punctuation was very confusing. Absolutely, I agree. I don't think the writer took time to correct punctuation. But when you look at what they've produced in a very short space of time, quite incredible. Actually, it is really good to be so imaginative, to throw things in like alliteration, onomatopoeia, similes, metaphors, technology, sci-fi. It is highly imaginative. So that is why the examiner was going Possibly, that's why the examiner overlooked these lapses, because the imaginative context is really, really well done. Okay, so hopefully that is food for thought for you um, when approaching your paper to imaginative writing tasks. Okay, and um, we've run out of time. Thank you for joining me today.